Thank you very much. So as Christophe said, I'm just going to present the first uh, conclusions that we have from the project. But before doing that, I have to say some uh, introductory things about the project and it would help if, ah, it does work. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so this is a project that falls under the umbrella of the more uh, general project of common core of uh, European private law. Um, uh, this is a project developed by Mauro Busani and Hugo Mate. It was launched 30 years ago in uh, Trento and it uh, draws uh, from the scholarship of uh, Rodolfo Sacco and Rudolf Schlesinger. Uh, Busani and Matei developed a specific uh, research methodology and fostered thematic collaborative researches. And the aim was to unearth what is common and what is uncommon in European private laws. So there are many common core groups on different topics that are running in parallel. And we're very happy to have with us Marta Infantino, who is responsible for all projects on torts. And the project that um, Christophe and myself uh, conduct uh, has the full title Personal Injury Compensation, a quantitative approach. Uh, we have, um, we started working, I think almost two years ago, we have 21 reporters from 14 jurisdictions, we have Austria, Belgium, Cyprus, Czech Republic, Denmark, England and Wales, France, Germany, Greece, Ireland, Italy, Lithuania, Netherlands and Spain. And uh, following the Common Core methodology, the research is based on factual questionnaire. Uh, it consists of 14 cases, and each case is meant to test one, actually more than one, but anyway, uh, specific issues. And on the slide, you can see just an example of such a case. I'm going to uh, come back to this example later. But I would like to explain how we came up with this uh, questionnaire. Again, following the Common Core methodology, Christophe and myself drafted a first version of the questionnaire. Then we had the possibility to discuss it in uh, two meetings with our reporters, and we are very thankful for that because with our comments, we improved it uh, considerably. And we also thank uh, Cole McGrath for editing it in proper English. And uh, the questionnaire uh, tests a variety of issues ranging from medical costs to home adaptation to lost profits that are undeclared or illegal to loss of earning capacity to frustrated expenses to different types of non pecuniary losses to losses of third parties and so on and what is I think interesting is the focus of the questionnaire on the quantum. So we asked the rapporteurs to the extent possible uh, on the basis of, well, their, the rules of their own legal system and case law to uh, have an estimate of how much compensation would the particular person uh, who is the hero of our case uh, get. Now we are at the stage where we have gotten the first results, the first answers uh, from the rapporteurs. And these answers are structured in the characteristic uh, three level responses of the Common Core. On the first level, we have the so-called operative rules. We have a very brief outcome of the case. The main part is the second one where we have the legal formants, meaning all the legal rules and precedents that uh, influence the, on, on which the decision is based. And then we have the extra legal formants, meaning some thoughts on uh, uh, reasons that go beyond the law that could influence the outcome, policy considerations, social values, or economic reasons. So, of course, in this presentation, I cannot present all the cases. I uh, have made a selection of some that are the most controversial ones and at the same time give some basis for a first attempt to group the jurisdictions. So uh, the first issue is the loss of earning capacity of a victim already at birth. 
and uh, a common starting point generally for future pecuniary losses in all jurisdictions is that we want to concentrate on the specific victim and since this is difficult in all jurisdictions there is a decreased standard of proof but when we have loss of earning capacity at birth all possibilities are open we don't know the talents the capabilities of this person we don't of course, know the willingness to work full time, part time or not at all. Uh, so the question is, how do different jurisdictions deal with that? Some jurisdictions are reluctant to deviate from the concrete assessment of damages. But at the same time, uh, it's considered inappropriate not to grant damages for the loss of earning capacity. So then there is a uh, try to use some criteria that are specific to the case in question. Uh, for example, in uh, um, uh, Belgium, in the Netherlands, in Germany, in England and in Cyprus to some extent, uh, the criteria used have to do with the income of other members of the family, uh, of the social economic status of the family. But as stated in the English report, and I very much like the expression, these are just impressionistic guesstimates. And also as stated in the German reports, this is an approach that in an egalitarian society, it is somehow puzzling. Uh, then other jurisdictions go with objective, not objective uh, criteria, like uh, Ireland with recourse to the average wage, France with recourse to the mean or medium uh, wage, uh, depending on the court. And in Italy, uh, which this amount is assessed as a multiple of social allowance. Then in common law jurisdictions, as we also uh, heard before for Australia as the last resort when there are not enough evidence, uh, the court may just award a lump sum. And in Spain in the past, it seems that this approach uh, was also used. And what is somehow functionally at least comparable, I think, is the Greek approach, where since there is not enough evidence to grant a specific amount for compensation for loss of earning capacity, courts use a special provision on disfigurement that allows them to grant a general amount for the pecuniary, not non-pecuniary, pecuniary losses due to the disfigurement. And such a provision exists also in Austria. Uh, it is always puzzling if this assessment also includes non-pecuniary losses. And I think that in Greece, it is particularly puzzling because the criteria used by case law is mainly the age of the victim, and the degree of disability, which are exactly the same criteria that are used, for example, in Italy for non-pecuniary losses because of impairment. And a rather more honest approach is the Czech one that we heard about before, that there is no compensation for pecuniary losses, but for non-pecuniary instead uh, on the basis of the difficulty in social application on the decreased uh, participation of this uh, person in society and what is really interesting here is that the amount that is awarded can be up to 400 times the average nominal gross monthly wage which actually means that the non-particular non-pecuniary losses are assessed on the basis of wages that in the case of question it it would be wages for 33 years. So I, I think that all these shortcomings uh, could, could be used to support a voice uh, in the Dutch literature, as mentioned in the Dutch report, that what we need here is the change of paradigm, a shift from the what if approach, what if there were no accident, to the what now approach. What about the needs that the person has now? What does this person need in order to be able to lead a dignified life? So after that, the second issue that has to do with uh, pecuniary damages I would like to talk about are the cases where the victim gets assistant, assistance by um, third person, usually members of the family, for free. 
So the victim doesn't really suffer a loss because receives services for free. But it is commonly accepted that the tortfeasor should not benefit from that. So he should pay compensation for this loss, which is a fictitious loss exactly because the victim didn't suffer himself or herself this uh, particular loss. And uh, it is also interesting to see that in the past, in some common uh, law jurisdictions uh, in Ireland and in Australia, uh, this loss was considered as a non-pecuniary loss. So again, we see this blurred line between what is a pecuniary loss and what is a non-pecuniary loss. Nowadays, it is generally accepted that it is a pecuniary loss, and we have two main questions. The first one is, does the victim who receives this compensation for the care, for the cost of the care that he didn't have to pay, have to render this amount back to the carer? In most countries, the answer is no. The victim is free to dispose of the compensation any way uh, the victim wants. But in Greece, there is a discussion in the literature that there is some legal obligation that could be derived by good faith. And that would be then an obligation to assign part of the compensation to the third party. Uh, and also in England, it is interesting that after a decision of the House of Lords of uh, 1994, uh, it was stated there that the, this amount of money is not awarded because of the claimant's needs, but as means to compensate the carer. And therefore, it should be held by the victim on trust for the providers of help. Of help. But this is also a very disputed um, issue. So then the second question is, could the carer, the third party who provided this assistance, bring directly a claim against the tort fissure? Well, in common law jurisdictions and also in the countries following the Germanic tradition, so Germany, Austria, uh, Greece, uh, the Czech Republic, the answer would be, well, no, because the tort fissure is not liable vis-a-vis -vis the third uh, person. But in the Netherlands, it is accepted that that would be possible, and then the amount of compensation would be the cost of services. What is interesting here is that in Belgium, France, Italy, and Spain, so countries following the Romanic tradition, the carer can bring a claim for the lost profits because the carer probably uh, stopped working or worked less in order to be able to provide for the care. But again, here in the French and the Italian report, um, there are some concerns that due to the remoteness of the damage, due to causation consideration, the claim could fail. And what is special is the case of Cyprus, where in a recent decision, the court of Cyprus decided that the victim himself does not have a claim in tort against the tort feature because the victim doesn't have a loss, but the carer has a claim. This claim cannot be based on tort because the tort feature doesn't have a duty of care vis-a-vis -vis the third person, but it's considered to uh, be based on unjust enrichment. And Having said that, now I come to the most controversial issues that have to do with non-pecuniary losses of the primary victim. For sure, in all jurisdictions, it's accepted that such losses are going to be compensated, but there is not an agreement what exactly is a non-pecuniary loss and how it should be assessed. And here we can see three main approaches. The one, the first one is those of the country that follow the Germanic tradition. And I think that it is a mistake actually to have the Czech Republic in there after uh, hearing the presentation before. But anyway, um, an element, a common element in Austria, in Germany, and in Greece is that there is a global amount that is granted for non pecuniary damages. The judge has great discretion. Uh, to decide on the basis of uh, criteria that have to do with the circumstances of the case, like the age of the victim, the intensity of pain, the degree of fault. 
in uh, Germany and in Austria, there are uh, relevant tables that are, have been structured by practitioners and to my understanding, they more or less codify past case law. Then uh, we have the countries following the Romanic traditions where there is a distinguish, a dist they distinguish between different heads of damages. And uh, the whole approach is much more technical. So actually there is a point system uh, depending on the severity of injury, which is graded in degrees. And then there are tables and then there are scales. Uh, this way one can determine the injury because of impairment, uh, bodily impairment. But then there are further tapes for other types, further tables for other types of non-pecuniary damages. Uh, still the judge, has a discretion, but I would guess in practice more limited. And for sure such a system serves a quality and leads to predictable results that could facilitate out of court settlements. And then we have a common law jurisdiction where there are fewer heads of damages, for sure uh, pain and suffering and loss of amenities. There are guidelines, there is predictability, but they're not as technical as the countries following the Romanic tradition. So some common elements is that the judge always have some discretion on the amount that they will award. And also that the non-awareness of the victim, the fact that the victim may be in a vegetative state is no reason, no reason to bar the recovery of non-pecuniary losses. It can have, though, an impact on the amount that is granted. This impact can be negative because the victim feels no pain. But since non-pecuniary losses cover also other types of damages, like the loss of amenities, it can also be positive. In the Czech report, uh, it's characteristically mentioned that if we have a victim in a vegetative state, actually this amount that will be paid is a price for his life. And uh, there are huge disparities uh, regarding the amounts that are awarded among the jurisdictions. You can see that here in the first case, we have an amputation of a leg above the knee and of an arm at the shoulder. And you can see here all the amounts that are granted. So in Greece and in the Netherlands, the victim would get around 100,000 euros, but in Italy, 1 million euros and the other countries are somewhere in between. Generally, the countries following the Romanic tradition are more generous and Italy is the paradise. And mm -hmm. as a rule of thumb, it seems to me that the more the heads of damage, the greater uh, the, the award in the end. So the final topic that also has to do with non-pecuniary losses uh, regards the non-pecuniary losses suffered by persons other than the primary victim. Uh, again, here, uh, common law jurisdictions are the most restrictive ones. In case of death of the primary victim, there is someone that gets some bereavement damages, some damages for grief. In England, this someone is the wife, but not the children. In Ireland and in Cyprus, also the children can get an amount, but there is a fixed amount per incident, not per person. And this fixed amount is then divided among the beneficiaries. So if there are many beneficiaries, it's one of them uh, gets a smaller amount. Uh, in other countries, the circle of beneficiary is uh, greater. And again, uh, we have uh, great disparities uh, regarding the amount. Uh, here, I would also like to note a particularity in Austria that such damages for grief are granted in cases the tortfeasor acted with gross negligence or intent. Uh, you see again here that Italy is the paradise. And again, the interesting feature of the Czech law that also this damage is calculated on the basis of the average gross monthly wage. And when it comes now to severe injury of the primary victim, so the victim did not die, but it is very, very seriously injured. 
in common law countries and in Germany and Greece, there is no possibility to get non-pecuniary damages for third persons. Although in Greece, there are some decisions of lower courts that say that in such a case, it is more or less as if the victim has died. So it would be possible, but there are few. These decisions are few. Whereas in other jurisdictions, like in Austria, if we have gross negligence or uh, intent, and in the Netherlands, there is no much uh, disagreement that uh, it is possible to get uh, compensation for bereavement for affection damages in Czech Republic that it is that is explicitly stated in the law and in the countries following the Romanian tradition in general there is not such a bar for third persons to claim compensation and when it comes now to well uh, further instances where uh, the primary victim is not very seriously injured, but has some uh, mental injury or some minor injury, but under situations that uh, were with a lot of stress, like terrorism or collapse of a building. It is only in the Romanic countries, the countries following the Romanic tradition, that it is possible for uh, third persons who suffered anxiety to get compensation. In other countries, this third person uh, have to have suffered from some diagnosed mental injury. So now some first conclusions, because we don't have second conclusions yet, we will have them sometime, is that if we try to think of some grouping of the countries, Unfortunately, it's going to be very boring because it's going to be the very traditional one. We have the common law jurisdictions in our project that is Ireland, England and Wales, and also Cyprus, because okay, Cyprus is generally a mixed jurisdiction, but the tort law of Cyprus is clearly uh, based on common law. Then we have the countries following the Germanic tradition, apart from Germany, also Austria and Czech Republic and Greece, and to a lesser degree, also the Netherlands. And then we have the countries following the Romanic tradition. Of course, then we have to see how we will fit in this distinction, Lithuania and Denmark. We don't have the full reports uh, of these countries yet. And then when it comes to substantial results, well, one that I can think of is that we could challenge the clarity of the usual distinctions of damages between pecuniary and non-pecuniary losses and also some principles like the concrete assessment of damages we put too much weight on that and we want to follow that but in the end in many instances we deviate without even explicitly stating that and of course since the project also deals with a quantum we have to seek some explanations for the great divergence of damages award between the countries because it seems that uh, human life and bodily integrity are more valued in the countries following the romantic tradition but the closer look could it perhaps be that if we have a country that has a better working social system and the victim can rely on that the victim needs less, less funds such a comment we have in the Danish uh, report. Or could it be that there are other underlying concerns of social justice from the part of the tortfeasor or from the insurance market that we don't want the insurance premiums to get very high? So these are all issues that we have to look in more detail. And thank you very much for your attention.